So welcome to the Not So Serious Science Podcast, where we discuss science in a way that your pet parrot can repeat it back to you. I'm your host, Pat. This is my co-host, Emmanuel. Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to introduce our guest today. He is a professor of paleontology at the University of Alberta. He has been passionate about dinosaurs since the age of two. Now, did you know that velociraptors actually look like small little turkeys with feathers? Now, this is a huge difference from the current Toronto Raptors logo. So the Raptors are probably going to have to consider changing the logo sometime soon. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Corwin Sullivan. Hey there, how's it going? Hi, welcome Corwin, how are you? Not bad, how are you doing? Good, good. Thank you so much for taking some time uh, away from your busy schedule to chat with us. Oh, absolutely, my pleasure. Can you briefly describe um, what you do at the University of Alberta? Uh, what's your role right now and what kind of research you're working on? Uh, well, I'm a vertebrate paleontologist uh, at the University of Alberta. I'm also the curator of the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum, uh, which is in Wembley, just outside the city of Grand Prairie. So it's four and a half, five hours from Edmonton, where the University of Alberta is. Um, so in those roles, um, I research uh, dinosaurs and their relatives primarily. Um, and I'm particularly interested these days in the vertebrates of Northern Alberta, the fossil vertebrates, um, because there are Cretaceous rocks uh, in the Grand Prairie area, right around the, the Curry Museum, um, that are really quite rich in dinosaurs and other things from the late Cretaceous. So we're talking about 73, 74 million years ago. Um, at, but those rocks are less explored than ones of about the same age in southern Alberta. So it's a great opportunity to get beyond classic dinosaur sites like Dinosaur Provincial Park, which is down south, and explore um, the province's extinct fauna a bit more widely. Um, another of my research interests is the evolution of um, structure and function on the evolutionary line to birds. And I worked on this quite a bit uh, during a slightly earlier stage of my career when I was actually based in Beijing at a research institute over there before moving to the University of Alberta. Um, but there there's, of course, the transition from dinosaurs or what we call non-avian dinosaurs to birds. Um, but going back further, um, there are other evolutionary transformations that happen along that evolutionary lineage that result in big changes to, to locomotion, to respiration, to other aspects of uh, function. So I'm very interested in that whole evolutionary story. Very cool. So when, when, we, when we refer to dinosaurs, uh, uh, you know, my first thought is like T-Rex, the rap, you know, raptors and so on. But really dinosaurs cover a lot more than our typical Jurassic Park kind of animals. Is, is that correct? Oh, that, that's absolutely correct. So Velociraptor and, and Tyrannosaurus rex are a good starting point. Um, they belong to a group called the theropods. And theropods are almost all bipedal anyway, um, mostly carnivorous. And they're also the group that gave rise to birds. So we can think of birds as modified theropod dinosaurs. And Velociraptor is a particularly close relative of birds. In fact, despite the way it's depicted in the Jurassic Park movies, Velociraptor in life probably would have been covered in feathers. So it was sort of a, sort of a giant killer chicken. <laughs> um, more than a giant killer reptile. Well, not and actually not that giant if we're talking about Velociraptor itself. That's another thing about the Jurassic Park movies. They depict Velociraptor as quite a big animal. Um, but Velociraptor was really, really quite small. Um, but then outside theropods, there are two other major dinosaur groups. There's the what we call the sauropod amorpha, and that includes the sauropods which are uh, long-necked, long-tailed plant eaters, and they include the largest animals uh, ever to walk the land. Um, animals that were pushing 100 tons in, in body mass, potentially. Um, and then sauropodomorpha include sauropods themselves, plus their primitive relatives, which is why we say sauropodomorpha, not just sauropoda. Um, and then there are the Ornithischians, and they're a, another group of plant-eating dinosaurs like sauropodomorphs, um, but quite distinct. And uh, Ornithischians are themselves quite diverse. They include horned dinosaurs and duck-billed dinosaurs, armored dinosaurs, and, and other groups. And a lot of them have um, fantastically ornamented skulls. So horned dinosaurs normally have horns and a large frill. 
Um, duck-billed dinosaurs in some cases have big crests. Um, so there is a lot of diversity within dinosaurs. You're absolutely right about that. There's been new discoveries that highlights brand new uh, dinosaurs that we never knew existed, even to this day, right? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, um, the, the pace is faster than ever before. Um, because paleontology is being done in, in more parts of the world. Um, you know, the, the pace of science in general, I'd say, has, has increased tremendously since the early days of paleontology. Um, so yeah, we're, we're living in a time of paleontological discovery, which is um, fun, but it can be a little exhausting because it's hard to keep up with everything. So are dinosaurs found throughout the entire world then you, you would say like, so it'd be like kind of like humans, you, you know, you'll find dinosaurs everywhere, but there might be some differences amongst where they're located. Yeah. Well, you, you can think of it as being a bit like animals today, right? You, know, you find different animals in Canada versus Russia versus Africa, you know, depending on where you go, you're going to encounter different faunas and different floras in different parts of the world. And it would have been like that at any given time in the geological past, but you've also got the time dimension with different rocks being preserved in different parts of the world. So it's all about the geology, right? In order to find dinosaurs, you need rocks that were deposited when dinosaurs were alive, and they have to be the right kind of rocks, what we call sedimentary rocks, from a suitable environment where dinosaurs lived. So it, it has to be on land. Um, there had to have been a local dinosaur fauna. But dinosaurs were pretty well pervasive. They lived all over the world over during a long stretch of the geological past, um, the, in the late Triassic period, and then in the subsequent Jurassic and Cretaceous. There were dinosaurs pretty well everywhere. Um, the question is more where they could be preserved, where rocks were being deposited that could turn them into fossils, and then where those rocks survived um, within, the, within the geological record rather than just eroding away. So that, that's what determines it. But every continent has a dinosaur fauna, um, some richer than others. Um, so the distribution of dinosaurs is patchy, but they really are all over the place. Um, e even in parts of the world that would seem geologically a bit unlikely Japan, for example, you do find some dinosaurs. Yeah. I read an article recently uh, where uh, they discovered in Russia um, a, a prehistoric, I think it was a, it, it was a bear, um, but a lot of it was conserved, like down to the teeth, the skin, um, and all that, which was fascinating. I actually saw a picture of it. It was just absolutely fascinating. In terms of the dinosaurs, has there been one that, that was, you know, normally it's just skits, bones that we, we uncover, but uh, just out of curiosity, you know, has there one that's been like the most well-preserved out there? Um, yeah, well, the, I've never found a, a specimen personally that had soft tissues preserved along with the bones and teeth, but there certainly are cases um, of, of dinosaurs that are preserved that way. And one of the attractive things about working in China is that they have an abundance of those specimens. Wow. Um, they come from northeast China in, in a western Liaoning province uh, primarily, but then the, the adjacent parts of Inner Mongolia and Hubei as well. And um, these, are, these are specimens that were um, deposited in lakes back in the Jurassic and the early Cretaceous. And in those lake environments, um, we don't know precisely how this works, but, but conditions were right in those lakes to preserve small vertebrates in uh, exquisite detail. Um, so you get complete skeletons of early birds, small mammals, lizards, um, dinosaurs closely related to birds um, that are intact and even have some soft tissues uh, such as feathers um, preserved along with the bones. Wow. And it's because of specimens like that that we actually know that feathers extend all back into theropod dinosaurs. They're not just present in birds, but they would have been present in Velociraptor and in even more primitive theropods, um, going back to, to quite early ones that were remote from birds and, and weren't really very bird-like at all. So if you were to um, uh, analyze Canada, what's the, what's the most predominant type of dinosaur you would find in Canada? So I lived in Manitoba for a couple of years. And I always read, uh, read news, uh, talk about mosasaurs, I guess. They're like huge marine reptiles, I guess. That seems mosasaurs, to be the most, yeah. yeah, they seem to be the most uh, predominant ones in Manitoba. What about like Alberta or even just Canada in general? Is there a specific type 
of, of dinosaurs we seem to, to encounter more often? Yeah, so mo mosasaurs are actually lizards um, okay. rather than dinosaurs. They're, okay. they're, 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 an, they're an interesting group, but I have a good colleague at the University of Alberta, Michael Caldwell, whose lab has uh, done a lot of mosasaur work over the years. Um, so they're, they're very intriguing, um, but they're outside dinosauria. And for actual dinosaurs, um, there are, they occur in different parts of Canada. I mean, there are, there are some in the Arctic, for example. There are um, some interesting early dinosaurs that we find in Nova Scotia. Um, but Alberta is really the epicenter, and it spills over into Saskatchewan and, and BC to a degree. But uh, so, and southern Alberta especially has been the hotspot, uh, and it's quite a it's quite a diverse um, dinosaur fauna that we have in this province. Um, the dinosaurs are late Cretaceous in age, but at that time there were lots of dinosaur groups around. Um, so we find theropods of different kinds, um, including fairly close relatives of Velociraptor. In fact, um, we find Tyrannosaurus and that its relatives. Um, we find horned dinosaurs, um, duck-billed dinosaurs, uh, the armored dinosaurs or ankylosaurs. Um, I have a student working on a, a group of small ornithischian dinosaurs called the Thessalosaurids that are quite interesting. Um, so it's a, it's a real mix. Why, why Alberta do you think is a hot spot? Was there a climate, a certain climate that was uh, more prone for them there or like why not? Um, it's, all, it's all about the geology. So um, in, the, in the late Cretaceous, um, the middle part of North America, sort of going up the midline of the continent, was covered by what we call the Western Interior Seaway. The, the Cretaceous was a hot time. There were, for, for the most part anyway, there was no ice at the poles and sea levels were high. So the, the ocean actually spilled onto the North American continent. And you had this Western Interior Seaway that was covering Manitoba and most of Saskatchewan. Um, and Alberta was right on the western edge of that seaway. So you had, a, you had coastal floodplains, which were a great habitat for dinosaurs, and also a great habitat for the deposition of sediments that became rocks to preserve those dinosaurs. And luckily, those rocks formed and then didn't, er didn't erode away completely and are now exposed at the surface. So um, it's very rich. I don't know if either of you gentlemen have ever been to uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park or other places like that in Southern Alberta, but it, it's just astonishing. You walk around some places in Dinosaur Provincial Park and the, the ground is almost littered with dinosaur bones and teeth. I mean, a lot of them are fragmentary. So it become, and you find bits of turtle shell and things as well. Um, so the name of the game is to find ones that are actually worth collecting. But uh, th those beds are extremely rich. And I've, um, you know, I've been there a, a couple of times with um, colleagues from China who have worked in very rich deposits in China, but have been really impressed with Dinosaur Provincial Park and, and what we have there, just with the, the sheer abundance of fossils. Wow. So how has um, technology improved uh, since, for example, when you were in school to, to now in helping with, with what you do? For example, you know, like you said, you know, a lot of people assume velociraptors, I, I guess, were, were large, you know, hairless uh, you know, uh, dinosaurs. But now you're saying they're more chicken-like. So is, is it because of the, the advancements in technology in, in uh, modeling uh, some of these dinosaurs? Well, that, that particular advance, figuring out the velociraptor and other theropods in that part of the family tree would have been feathered, um, really comes from the, the specimens of Northeast China and to some extent in other parts of the world. But it's because we now have specimens that show us preserved feathers that we know their distribution. Um, with that said, um, technology is making a big difference field. Um, one, one big one is uh, scanning technology, um, CT scanning, essentially. Um, a medical CT scanner doesn't usually do a great job on a fossil because rock is dense, but, um, but there are more specialized CT scanners that um, will do a good job of probing the internal structure of a fossil. So you can put a small fossil skull in, a CT scan, in one of these CT scanners, um, make a scan, and then you can see the anatomy of the brain case. You can see lots of, lots of internal features. 
that you otherwise wouldn't have access to without destroying the fossil. Um, so in the in the twentieth century, there were some studies where they took fossils and gradually destroyed them, basically grinding them apart layer by layer so that they could see the internal structure. And that method worked fine. I mean, it provided information equivalent to CT scanning, but you destroyed the fossil in the process, and it was also very laborious. Um, so, so we have that scanning technology. Um, there are methods of chemical analysis, which I don't know a great deal about, but it, it's possible to um, look at the chemical composition of the fossils and how um, how tissues have actually been preserved in, in ways that wouldn't have been possible previously. And then, of course, on the sort of the, the analysis and publication end of things, um, just having easy access to powerful statistical software and software that we can use to um, arrange, arrange photos of fossils and create illustrations, that kind of thing, um, really helps us produce high quality papers um, faster than the previous generation of paleontologists could have. Can you actually uh, extract any genetic material from, from any of these uh, fossils at all? It, it would it would be great, um, and it would it would be it would be especially good actually um, for working out which dinosaurs were related to each other because people who work on the evolutionary relationships of modern animals um, of course can look at the anatomy and the structure of the skeleton to look for similarities essentially, but can also look at the DNA and find similarities at the molecular level um, to tell them what's related to what. Uh, unfortunately, uh, DNA is not a very durable um, molecule at all. Um, so you can get, there's increasing evidence that you can get preserved proteins in dinosaur fossils sometimes, um, at least perhaps. Um, but DNA is, is just uh, too perishable. Um, so DNA can be extracted from very young fossils, from Ice Age mammoths and uh, things, things of that vintage. Um, but dinosaurs are unfortunately far too old, so we'll never be able to clone them and we'll never have access to that source of information about their evolutionary relationships or other aspects of their biology. Uh, so Jurassic Park is just a myth then, the movie. Uh, uh, yeah, just just a fantasy, although a, a clever one. I was always kind of impressed that uh, Michael Crichton thought of that. Yeah. Speaking of myths, like, what are some myth busters out there? Um, like, for example, you know, dinosaurs have feathers. Uh, that that's one. But outside of that, are there any sort of common knowledge that people think uh, that you can just pretty much blow up right now? <laughs> um, well, I guess uh, there, there's often a lot of confusion about what what is a dinosaur and what isn't right mosasaurs are an example but uh dinosaurs are often conflated with pterosaurs which are the flying reptiles right. um pteranodon is a famous example so uh they, they're closely related to dinosaurs but they're they're not dinosaurs and um shouldn't be referred to as dinosaurs um the the fact that uh birds are dinosaurs is um you know, widely appreciated by paleontologists, and I think seeping more into the public consciousness. But that, that I mean, that really was worked out in the, the 1980s and 1990s, um, you could say, or at least firmed up at that time. And that's really changed our view of dinosaurs to a degree, because um, if you think of birds as modified dinosaurs, which we do, then it becomes a myth that dinosaurs are extinct. Dinosaurs are still with us today wow. um, in the form of birds. And that's, that's not just a, a change in the definition or a, a little talking point. It's, it's important in that we can look at the biology of birds and gain some insights into how extinct dinosaurs would have lived and functioned. So are, are birds more related to dinosaurs than, let's say, a crocodile or lizards out there? Yep, so birds are so birds absolutely are dinosaurs, gi given the way that we think of relationships now, right? Um, so the so this and this is a change in the way taxonomists operate. But in under our sort of our current paradigm for classifying animals, which is called cladistics or phylogenetic systematics, um, any animal descended from a particular group has to be considered a member of that group. So humans, for example, are apes 
apes are monkeys because humans evolved from among apes, apes evolved from among monkeys. So we can say that because birds have evolved within the diversity of dinosaurs, evolved from among theropod dinosaurs in particular, um, birds are dinosaurs. Whereas pterosaurs and crocodilians and, and mosasaurs along with other lizards are what we would call outgroups, so two, two dinosauria. So they're, rel so they're related to dinosaurs to different degrees, but outside that group that's descended from the common ancestor of all dinosaurs, whereas birds did descend from that ancestor, so they're within the dinosaurian family, to use that term loosely. So how long, how far back have dinosaurs roamed the Earth? Uh, about 225 million. So the dinosaurs we have in Alberta go almost up to the end of the time of the dinosaurs, which was about 66 million years. That was when the, the famous meteor hit, uh, meteorite, and um, dinosaurs went extinct, other than, of course, birds, right, which were the one surviving dinosaur lineage. Um, but that, that really was the end of the story. And the story began in the late Triassic period, um, as far as we can see, about 225 million years ago. So dinosaurs emerged as part of a late Triassic fauna that included actually a lot of things related to crocodilians. There was a lot of diversity in that group at the time. Um, but then dinosaurs appeared and uh, took over rather quickly. So um, in, the, in the Jurassic, dinosaurs really diversified and then they continued to thrive throughout the Cretaceous, and then the, the meteor came along and ended the party. So there is, a, there is evidence that a meteor was the cause of extinction, uh, not just uh, normal changes to climate or geological changes then? Yeah, there was, there, there's good geological evidence um, in the form of what, what's basically a fossil crater that we find on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. So it's a big crater of the right age, um, with all the sort of features you'd expect from um, an impact crater. And then there's evidence in the geological record for, um, you know, wi widespread devastation at the time, um, wildfires and so on. And what we see in the fossil record is a very rapid turnover from a thriving dinosaur fauna with, uh, you know, accompanying vegetation and other animals to, um, much, a much less diverse world, right, initially. So above the Cretaceous is a slice of geological time that we call the Paleocene. And the early Paleocene is kind of post-apocalyptic in the sense that um, life isn't terribly, isn't terribly diverse. A lot of things were removed suddenly, and um, not much had evolved to replace them. So the Paleocene was also there for a time of opportunity because it meant that the living, um, the things that had survived, could diversify into ecological niches that had been left empty by extinction. And that's been the cycle throughout geological time. Um, big extinctions happening, opening up ecological space, and then the surviving groups radiating into that space. Right, are, are the first, I'm assuming this, I always thought that the first dinosaurs were in the water. So was it some kind of fish? Well, the first, the first vertebrates were, were certainly in the water, um, but we're going back now to more like 500 million years ago, um, way before the time of the dinosaurs. So you have a, a process where um, fish diversify in water, and then, of course, fish don't go anywhere. They continue to diversify in the water, and that's continued up to the present day. But one lineage of fish underwent an evolutionary transition to land, and became what we call tetrapods. So tetrapods, if, if you go back to the Greek, it means four-footed. So all vertebrates that are not fish are tetrapods, essentially. So the tetrapods are the land vertebrates and also include some vertebrates like mosasaurs and like whales that have returned water, right, secondarily. But tetrapods underwent a whole process of diversification where first you had things that you can think of essentially as amphibians, um, and then the evolution of reptiles. Then within reptiles, you have the appearance of a group called the Archosauria, uh, which means the ruling reptiles. And that includes dinosaurs, pterosaurs, uh, crocodilians, and a number of other groups that didn't really make it out of the Triassic. Uh, so it's within the diversity of archosaurs that you have dinosaurs.
How did you、uh, become interested in paleontology, and、uh, you know, how how do you train to to become a paleontologist、uh, for you, for our young listeners? Well, I don't remember how I first became interested in paleontology because it happened very early. Apparently, when I was two years old, I was telling、really? people that I was going to be a paleontologist,、That's、and、true. it was just、um, you know, I grew up with dinosaur books and dinosaur toys,、uh, and I, I spent. The first part of my childhood, mostly in Scarborough,、um, in the Toronto area, until I was、uh, 12 years old.、Um, so the Royal Ontario Museum was right there, and、uh, the Royal Ontario Museum has、uh, wonderful dinosaur displays. If you haven't seen them, I'd, I'd recommend them. But I mean, it's a great museum in all, in many respects. But、um, it has it does paleontology very well. So that was very inspiring, as well as yeah, dinosaur books, dinosaur toys,、um, fossil hunting in southern Ontario with my parents. You know, they were very patient about sometimes taking me out to find the very ancient marine invertebrates that you can discover in that area. And then when I was twelve, we moved to Victoria, where.、Um, Again, I could find marine invertebrates, although younger ones. Some were Cretaceous, some were even younger than that.、Um, but there were lots of fossil hunting opportunities, and actually very active amateur fossil hunting societies that、um, I could go out with.、Um, so, you know, when when you're a child, your interests tend to vary. So,、um, there there was a time in my childhood when I wanted to be an astronomer, and a time when I wanted to be a marine biologist, a time when I wanted to be a writer. But paleontology was the one that I kept going back to,、um, and then there was a, a period as a teenager when I was starting to read more widely and read things that were a bit more serious. And I discovered, in particular, the writings of Stephen Jay Gould, who、uh, was an American、um, paleontologist who、uh, worked on invertebrates, worked on snails, actually, but wrote about a very wide range of topics in paleontology and evolution. Um, you know, a very, a very literate and thoughtful standpoint, and his writings in particular, and some other things that I was reading around that time,、um, helped me realize that paleontology wasn't just about going out and finding fossils; that it had this whole intellectual and theoretical side. Right, it's a discipline with real、um, academic weight to it.、Um, so that made the idea of a career in academic paleontology、uh, seem. More attractive than it had previously, even more attractive. It's been a really big passion of yours since the very beginning, so you're definitely in the right field here. <laughs>、um, it has, yeah. It's actually a lot. A lot of my colleagues have origin stories that are kind of like that too.、Um, I mean, a lot of children go through a dinosaur phase, and quite a few paleontologists are. Basically, people who went into that phase and never really came out of it. <laughs> So, what are、uh, what other career options are there for paleontologists besides academia? Um, not not that many. It really is a field where most people who are full time paleontologists、um, work in either university or museum settings.、Um, with that said,、uh, some people do consulting, and、um, paleontology is a it, it's nice in that it's a field. One of the things I really like about paleontology is that it's one area of science where.、Um, Amateurs can make、uh, really important contributions. You know, some important fossils are found by people who aren't professional paleontologists, may not even have any formal training in the field, but just go out on the weekends and find fossils, right?、Um, and there are also people who are fully academically trained、um, paleontologists,、uh, like a good colleague of mine here in Alberta, who、um, work mainly doing other things, like. As a high school teacher, and in, in his case,、um, but still stay involved in the field,、um, just by going out and collecting fossils and by continuing to publish on them.、Um, so it's great that way. And、uh, there are some paleontologists who also、uh, do consulting um, work, um, mainly because when, especially here in Alberta and in other regions where fossils are found,、um, often when you know when a building is being constructed, for example, or Something like that's being done. Infrastructure is being built. It's necessary to do a paleontological assessment to make sure important fossils aren't being destroyed in the process. And I, I don't know exactly how that works, but、um, someone has to be paid to come in and do the assessment. And some paleontologists、uh, work in that area. So there's a possibility that amateurs like Pat and myself, we go to a site, we find some bones, we think nothing of it. You know, either throw it away or bring it home. So that could be like the 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 rarest find, but you would never know about it. 
yeah, um, <laughs> that that happens. I mean, like <laughs> typically, if we're talking, um, <clears throat> you know, if we're talking about a, a complete skeleton, um, there's going to need to be some excavation. You're not going to find a, or you're rarely going to find a, a an important dinosaur skeleton just sitting on the surface. Although that sometimes does happen too, right? Essentially. Um, but yes, uh, the, you, you could go out, you could find something important. So if, if you do find a fossil that looks at all interesting, um, by all means, contact a paleontologist about it, right? Um, and just, just send a photo and say, hey, what is this? Um, but of course, there are laws that govern fossil collecting and what you can and can't do in different provinces. So it's, uh, it's important to be mindful of those. So question for you. Um, so T-Rex versus three Velociraptors, who wins? <laughs> oh, I, I'd say the T-Rex, possibly barely noticing the Velociraptors. They, they really are small. Okay. Uh, so, They're small chickens, remember? <laughs> yeah, hand, yeah, hands down. Well, what, yeah, so, yeah not, not quite as small as chickens, maybe more turkey sized, but oh, turkey, wow. not on the scale of a T Rex. I'm talking yeah. about those raptors there in the, in the Jurassic Park movie. What are they called then? If they're not, are they velociraptors? Is that it? So, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, they're, they're called that in the movies. Um, they're, they're really more like um, Utah raptor, probably, which is a larger relative of velociraptor. Okay, so those, um, those three of those versus the T Rex. What do you think? Oh, that yeah, that that'd be more of a contest. But you know, I'd I'd still bet on the the T Rex. I mean, size is a pretty overwhelming advantage when you're talking about animals of broadly similar anatomy. And uh, yeah, the, the T Rex has all these weapons. It could knock them over with its tail. It could, you know, probably lean over and get them with its teeth. And yeah, they they could kind of nip and slash at it with the. But I I don't think they could do a great deal of damage. Imagine, uh, imagine the Toronto Raptors. Uh, they had to change their logo to be more, uh, more accurate. <laughs> we have a more chicken-like uh, raptor as a as a logo instead. <laughs> I, I have to confess that I don't know offhand what their logo looks like, yeah. but it, but if it is a, you know, if it is, is a Velociraptor, it absolutely yeah. should have feathers. Yeah, it's uh, it's more yeah, it's more based on Jurassic Park. So definitely, yeah. uh, I don't <laughs> think it's a, it's a true depiction for sure. No, that should be a consult a paleontologist. <laughs> The birds aspect is is great. Like I didn't I didn't know that at all in terms of uh, how they're actually still to this day dinosaurs. That that's that's a, a crazy concept. Yeah, it, it is. And you can uh, that next time you look at a bird, um, think about that way and, and see if you see it a bit differently. Because I remember that I did when I I learned that you know that after I learned as a student that birds were in fact dinosaurs. Um, I started to see birds a bit differently because, you know, birds have have scaly legs, a lot of them, right? Unless the feathers go all the way down. And the, the way they the way they move, the way they behave, um, the way they look, you you can sort of see hints of dinosaur there if you kind of know to look for them. Mm -hmm. So so what is the, the biggest question uh, that people are trying to answer right now uh, within the dinosaur field that you think? Like what is that big breakthrough that people are hoping to to achieve? Well, oh, um, goodness. Well, there are um, there are lots of them actually. Um, we're we're not sure exactly how far back feathers go. That's that's a big one. I mean, we know that they go well back into theropods. But one intriguing thing is that there are also a couple of ornithischian dinosaurs in which feather-like structures are known. And these are very simple feathers, as are the earliest theropod feathers. Um, they're sometimes described as filamentous feathers. So they're, they're more like hairs or bristles, feathers of a modern bird. Um, but we know that they eventually evolved into avian-style feathers. So filamentous feathers occur in relatively primitive theropods. They occur in ornithischians a couple of ornithischians, and actually even pterosaurs um, in, in some cases are well-preserved and you can see, again, little hair-like structures associated with the, the pterosaur. So is it possible that filamentous feathers of ornithischians, filamentous feathers of theropods, and these hair-like structures in pterosaurs are really all the same thing? And that filamentous feathers at least go back to the uh, the common ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Well, maybe, but we don't have the fossil evidence to say whether that was the case or not. So that's uh, that, that's one mystery that needs solving. Right. I'm assuming you can kind of trace the evolution of the dinosaurs um, and 
you know, are there gaps, um, you know, right now within the... Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, you know, it, if you have, if you think of it as an evolutionary sequence, right, and you have a gap, and then you find an animal right in the middle of that gap, of course, it creates two gaps, right? Smaller ones. But yeah, so the, the gappiness is never going to disappear completely. Um, but there are, there are some quite significant ones. And, and one's, one that I'm curious about pertains to the early history of a, a group called the Oviraptorosaurs. And these are theropods that are a little less closely related to birds than Velociraptor would be, but relatively close. They, they did have bird-like feathers. Um, and they're, they're kind of peculiar looking theropods. They, they didn't have, t well, except the very early ones, they didn't have teeth at all. They had a, they had a beak and they had a really strangely shaped skull. The oviraptorosaurs are interesting, but the, early, the earliest oviraptorosaurs we know about are from the early Cretaceous. And the group must have appeared based on its place in dinosaur phylogeny um, well before the end of the Jurassic. But we don't have oviraptorosaurs that represent the early part of that history. Um, so we don't know what a, what a late Jurassic oviraptorosaur was like, really. Um, and that's interesting to me, because the, uh, the primitive oviraptorosaurs of the early Cretaceous are, are well exemplified by a thing called caudipteryx. And caudipteryx is, again, kind of turkey-sized and um, covered in bird-like feathers, but it had short little forelimbs and... Um, it was a fairly heavy-bodied thing, so it clearly wasn't flying. Um, and then the question is, what what was it doing with these bird-like feathers? Right? Were they were they just for display, which is maybe the most likely thing, or um, was it using them? Was it waving its wings, its little wings, around somehow to generate small aerodynamic forces that would have been useful in terrestrial locomotion, you know, in running? Um, or did it possibly evolve from something that actually could fly? and had become secondarily flightless, right? But we don't, but the answer to that might lie in Jurassic over Raptorosaurus, but we haven't found one yet. Hmm. Now I read, I read back then that um, obviously a lot of people thought, you know, the T-Rex the as being the biggest carnivore during that time. I heard there's a, there's a even bigger one that was discovered um, there, there have been there have been claims, and you know, estimating body mass in dinosaurs is not that straightforward, um, right? There are different ways of doing it, and they all have some error attached. So it's hard to say exactly which dinosaur was the biggest. Um, but as far as I know, um, Tyrannosaurus rex actually still is um, probably uh, the biggest theropod dinosaur. It's a lot smaller, of course, than Brontosaurus and, you know, at other sauropods. Um, and there are, there are also some Ornithischians that were quite a bit bigger than Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, but, but for theropods, yeah, um, T-Rex seems to be the king. So to, to study paleontology, uh, do you just enter biological sciences uh, per se, and then, and then you specialize in paleontology at the graduate uh, school level? Is, is that usually how it works? Um, well, there are students who take biology, um, yeah, as undergraduates. There are students who take geology, oh, geology, and there are students who do a combination of both. And I, I did a combination at the University of Victoria um, back in the 90s. Um, and traditionally, um, it, it depends to some degree on whether the student is interested in vertebrates or invertebrates, uh, because vertebrate paleontology is a more biological discipline. We do more, more anatomy and uh, think more about the biology of fossils, whereas invertebrate paleontologists tend to be more geologically focused. Um, they, you know, it's, it's a different world in that um, Fossil invertebrates tend to be simpler in their structure than fossil vertebrates, right? We would find a whole skeleton with bones and teeth. Um, they would find a shell. So there's, there's less anatomical work that can be done, typically. Um, but then fossil invertebrates, and I really envy this, fossil invertebrates often occur in huge numbers, right? You can find a, a fossil bed that has thousands of shells. So you can do a lot of statistical work on the diversity of those shells, um, and you can also use them as geological markers, right? Sometimes finding shells of a particular type 
can tell you very precisely where you are in the geological record. So a lot of invertebrate paleontologists um, spend a lot of their time on, on stratigraphy, on the, you know, the study of geological layers, essentially. Well, Dr. Sullivan, I, I, I thought that, um, you know, sharks were, uh, you know, a very prehistoric animal, um, which leads me to my question, in terms of, like, in the, the world today, in the ocean, you know, what, what type of organism or fish is cl the most closely related to, to the, you know, dinosaurs? Is it, you know? Cro well, so crocodilians are quite closely related to dinosaurs, yeah, and there is a saltwater crocodile that spends a fair bit of its time in the sea. Um, but sharks are, of course, are a group of fish, and they go way back um, before the origin of the dinosaurs. So the, this, the initial diversification of fish that I talked about before dinosaurs appeared produced um, not quite sharks like we have today, but primitive members of the shark lineage, and they have their own evolutionary story, right? So there, there was a shark lineage that um, existed before any recognizable dinosaur lineage and went on diversifying in the ocean as dinosaurs rose and fell on land and then after the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs, birds continued to diversify. So that's one whole story. But evolutionary stories happen in parallel, right? So while dinosaurs and then birds were diversifying, um, sharks were also diversifying in the sea, um, as were other fish groups. Yeah, that's always fascinating me, like a, a living animal, you know, today that has lineage, like way back. Yeah, yeah well, there, there are lots. And an example I particularly like is a fish called the coelacanth. And uh, coelacanths are another group that appeared around the time the shark lineage did you know, back in the Devonian. And in the, in the Devonian, they were pretty common and we find them in the fossil record through the Triassic and then into the Cretaceous, and then they disappear from the fossil record. So a hundred years ago, if you were talking to a paleontologist, um, the paleontologist would have said, well, coelacanths went extinct um, in the middle of the Cretaceous. But then in 1938, a coelacanth actually turned up uh, a modern one um, off the coast of South Africa. And uh, a museum curator was sharp enough to recognize this coelacanth um, among the catch that a fishing ship had brought in. Yeah. Um, the curator would regularly, you know, she, she was an ambitious young curator at a small museum in South Africa. And she'd made friends with some of the fishing captains and they'd let her look through what they'd caught to see if there was anything interesting that she wanted for the museum. And she saw this coelacanth and recognized it as something really unusual and got into contact with other, um, other, well, other scientists who were able to uh, identify it as a living coelacanth. Um, so now that we know there, and since then another population has also been discovered off Indonesia. So there are a couple of species of living coelacanths, um, even though we thought this was a group that had disappeared back in the Cretaceous. So um, that was a, a major zoological discovery and um, just shows that, yeah, we do have some quite ancient lineages still with us today. I'm going to have to look up a picture of that after this. <laughs> I don't know how that looks like. <laughs> yeah, oh, very, very worthwhile. They're strange looking fish too. Um, they're, they, live, they live in the deep sea. And they're, they're what are called lobe-finned fish. Um, so these are, these are fish that have quite muscular fins um, that are rather different than the more delicate fins you'd see on a goldfish or something. Um, and lobe-finned fish are the group of fish that tetrapods um, evolved from, land vertebrates. So these muscular fins basically turned into muscular limbs during the transition to land. No way. That's, that's neat. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you so much, Dr. Solo. We've learned a lot more than just uh, uh, T. Rex and, and uh, Velociraptors. Uh, you know, you've, it's been very enlightening. Uh, you know, just just how you got into the field. Um, you know, and and what you're doing uh, in, in really enriching our knowledge uh, regarding dinosaurs and, and the evolution of, of you know of, of Earth. Really. Yeah. Good luck with your research, and uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. Great job. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, you too. Bye. 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 Hey kids, thanks so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Please click on a couple of these videos to watch Emmanuel and I interview scientists and talk science in a way that 
pretty much your aunt can understand. 